Bonneville flood and the Missoula flood. The Bonneville flood is 40, th at its peak discharge, is 40,000 cubic feet per second. 40 million. For, excuse me, 40 million <laughs> cubic feet. <It's> important. <laughs> That's very important, yes. Um, and Missoula is 750 million. And mm -hmm. Missoula is coming from Canada. Yep. And Bonneville's coming from Utah, essentially. Yes. And they're meeting at Tammany Creek. They're meeting right there, yes. Yes. That, which to me, that is, uh, yeah, I mean, that is an extremely, one of the most interesting outcrops in North America, I would say, because of what it seems to indicate. What I actually want to do is roll this into the whole question of, when you raised, you raised, I mean, so going through all this, to me, of course, the question it keeps reasserting itself over and over and over again is, okay, well, what's the cause? What's mm -hmm. the explanation for something like this, right? Now, I'm of the mind that, and, and this is mainstream geology doesn't go here with this. I believe that we have to look at the outside. We have to look out there, ultimately, to find the explanation. I don't believe that purely terrestrial-based explanations make sense. If it was to be terrestrial, well, what do you think it could be? We've talked about volcanic act, volcanic activity. Well, we Talked can about. see we can see that up in Iceland right now. We can see right. that there are out volcanically produced outburst floods up in Iceland, and they are locally catastrophic, no doubt. But they're orders of magnitude smaller than what we're looking at here mm -hmm. where you've got literally big volcanoes erupting under the 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 uh iceland the i forget the name of it uh i think the the the, the one of the main volcanoes i think is vatnajokull something like that i don't remember the name of the but yeah if you pull up a map of well hell we can just i can pull up i've got i got it open right here okay so you've got these large glacier masses on iceland and then several of them there's volcanoes under them particularly this larger one. Mm -hmm. And periodically that volcano goes off, warms up, and it melts and creates a, a subglacial reservoir. And then that subglacial reservoir will work its way through to the, to the perimeter of the ice sheet, and then it'll burst out in an outburst flood called the uh, Jokalops. And that's where the term for these outburst floods come from. My problem is, is that I've looked for modern analogies and they're minuscule compared to what we're talking about here. <clears throat> so it's one thing to say uh, that there's, you know, there, since the end of the Little Ice Age, there have been quite a few outburst floods documented in Alaska, in the Canadian Rockies, in Tibet, in the Pyrenees, in the Alps, etc. Are they the result of anything exceptional? Well, they're because what happens when the glaciers are melting and receding back is you form ponded water against, like, for example, a, a, tri a tributary glacier may melt, and then it's ponded against the main trunk glacier. But at the same time, the trunk glacier is shrinking, the ponded water is increasing, and at some point it breaches a threshold and, and escapes, usually by finding a fissure through the ice or even going under the ice sub subglacially. But again, the magnitudes of those are are insignificant. Okay, we're going to kind of zoom out now to um, try to get a better uh, sense of the big picture. So here we have the Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> and we started out this, this uh, conversation talking about Salt Lake down here. Here's the Snake River Plain. And here's the Columbia Basalt Plateau. And right in here is where the Snake River flows into the Columbia. Well, here's, here's the snake coming here. It flows into the Columbia here, which is coming out of up here in Canada. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and then... I want you to notice the, the, the trending of the valleys here. You see how this is trending more or less north-south? This is trending more or less north-south. You've got all of these long valleys that are trending north-south here, right? Mm -hmm. Now, all of this was covered in glaciers during the LGM, the late glacial maximum, okay? Important to keep that in mind. 
Now, look at the Snake River Plain. You see it makes this big arc? Well, around 17 million years ago, this chaotic area right here was over here. This is where, ye- that's Yellowstone Lake right there. The mantle plume is, sits right under here. This represents the motion of the North American plate over the mantle. Whoops, over the mantle plume. So picture this. If I'm, Here's the mantle plume coming up, and the plate is moving over it like this. Mm-hmm. So you can actually trace the arc. This is the motion. If you were to play this backwards, 17 million years, this area would go right back here, and it would be here. Now, this area is very interesting. <clears throat> it's very chaotic. Lots of faults, fractures, and in fact, the whole here, all of this is basalt. Huge volumes of liquid basalt that flowed out of feeder dikes that were all in this area right here. For 10 million years, there were these outflows of these, this outflowing of liquid basalt forming layer upon layer in some places several miles thick, right, layered of these basalts. And then they sort of tapered off and came to an end around 6 million years ago. And they've been mostly inactive, although Craters of the Moon right down on here was actually uh, extruded about ten or 12,000 years ago. So it's like there's still some some bleeding, if you will. Okay. <clears throat> So what initially triggered this massive outpouring of basalt 17 million years ago? Well, there's several geologists that think possibly there was an impact. And if you had a a high-dense object coming in at, you know, 15 miles per second or whatever, fairly perpendicular to the surface of the Earth, boom, it's going to be able to punch its way really deep into the crust. What you're then going to have is what's called pressure relief melting. And it's going to be this upwelling. And I think that's the most likely explanation <clears throat> for this massive basaltic bleed out that occurred that created this whole basalt plateau here. Mm. Well, this was the site of these great mega floods that J. Harlan Bretz was studying back in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. My cursor's pointing to a lake right there. It's called Lake Pond this is where the water came down this trough right here called the Purcell Trench. Came down here and it spilled out and flowed across the basalt plateau here, hit the snake, and that's where they back flooded because the Tammany Bar is right in here. So Tammany Bar is right Well, they're not showing. Yeah, okay, so Tammany Bar is right in here. Right here in this area. Mm-hmm. The yeah. floods came down from this way. And you can see the, the relationship between the floods and the dis- distribution of glaciers at the time they occurred. Here's satellite photographs, and you can see two of the great flood spillways across the basalt plateau. Here's one of them. This is called the Cheney Palouse. And there's another one called the Telford. Now, both of those are coming down. One of the Telford is coming directly off of what looks like discharging from the mouth of where the Columbia River comes out of the mountains and makes this sharp bend to the west right here. Mm -hmm. The Cheney Palouse is discharging from this trough right here. Now, this area between Spokane and and Lake Ponderé is where Victor Baker did his hydrological analysis and realized that the flow coming through this trough right here reached or even exceeded 750 million cubic feet per second. So the bulk of that water came through here and washed down and created what you see here. These darker areas, because what, what it is is you've got several hundred feet of lust topsoil laid like a blanket on top of the hard basalt bedrock underneath it. When the floods came through, they washed away the lus and exposed the bedrock beneath. And that's what you're seeing right here, see? this? These landscapes out here are ex- unbelievably spectacular, when you know what, especially when you know what you're looking at. And it's a good way to 
sort of immerse your own consciousness and awareness of mega floods is to do a tour of these landscapes. So this is kind of the plan for uh, the Bonneville flood we've got coming up is we're thinking we would start, you know, in Salt Lake City and we would follow the route of the flood all the way up to Hell's Canyon. So this is uh, five, taken from 500 miles up. This is one of the early satellite photographs of the of the Channel Scablands. So here, your Cheney Palouse is coming down here. And this is, you can see down here, it intersected the snake. So when this water hit here, some of it flowed to the west, which was downhill, and some of it back flooded. There was so much water coming down here that it back flooded up the snake. And way over here off the screen would be where Tammany Bar is. Hmm. So are you starting to get the, how the pieces fit together here? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess the thing that uh, I don't know that uh, is still, I don't know how it would func- how it would happen is what caused Bonneville Lake to flood so much, this, the, le- the water level to rise so rapidly. Well, I figure it had to be rainfall. I mean, what else is there? It could have certainly been augmented by snow melt, by glacier melt off the adjacent mountains. Because, yeah, there were glaciers. But they weren't part of the great ice sheet. Like, this water here is discharging directly from the great ice sheet. Right. See? Unlike Bonneville, which didn't. So, this is direct melt water. Bonneville, well, how else are you going to fill up uh, the lake basin? It had to have been rainfall. Now, if they were happening at the same time, which what that what the evidence at the quarry there, uh, the gravel pit, suggests, is that do we look for a common cause then? Do we look at something that could simultaneously melt extraordinary volumes of ice and cause extraordinary rainfall, you know, hundreds of miles to the south over Utah? And the answer is, well, yeah, we do actually are mechanisms in nature that could probably do that Hmm. but they're not of this earth and that's where this discussion needs to go because see we've got this legacy from our past i guarantee i promise you native americans all over north america have stories and legends and understanding about these events that have been handed down for thousands and thousands of years contrary to what the archaeologists are willing to acknowledge They've apparently done this. They've got stories about these great floods that occurred at the end of the Ice Age, right? So those need to be taken seriously. And when they are, we will realize that the details, even though they sound idiosyncratic and exotic and kind of weird, actually aren't so exotic and can actually give us legitimate insight, valid insight into these events, right? Now, on the other hand, we have science. Like, we're looking at, you know, this photograph here was probably taken uh, in the 19, I think it was in the 1970s. And it was the first satellite photograph of these landscapes, right? So, at that point, you know, in the final quadrant of the 20th century is when we begin to, human species on Earth begin to realize that there's this, this whole story, that 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 is that there's no way we can understand the human past on this planet without understanding this story that I'm showing you right here because this was a major dividing line w- once you realize the the magnitude of this and the scale of it and the scope of it the global scope of these events you begin to understand yeah this was profoundly significant and we can understand why you know what would in the aftermath of of 40 million cubic feet per second if there had been villages or hamlets or colonies God. or so, yes, what's going to be left? Nothing. Nothing. But I wanted to introduce you to this for the simple reason that we're looking at a bigger picture here. And I don't think that mainstream geologists have gotten a bigger picture yet. Because, see, <clears throat> here's the thing. It's just like with archaeology, geology, you tend to look at, one particular outcrop, you look at partic- one particular facies, it's called, or you look at one particular strata and deciphering that, and you might spend five years looking at one outcrop. 
See, there are geologists that are really, really knowledgeable about a particular area, region, the geology of the region. They know the bedrock. They know the petrology, the lithology. They know the groundwater. All They know where the ores, they've been, pro- right? But they don't necessarily see how that fits into a larger picture, maybe on a continental or a hemispheric or even a global scale. Right. That's what we are going to try to do here, Beckett, with this, is we're going to try to bring the big picture. And I think that picture, like I said, I think that that once we see the scope of this, we go, okay, if we try to limit our 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 attempts to explain these things by purely terrestrial mechanisms, we're going to be, it's going to be, that's going to be tough. How How, how does that work, right? But as soon as we're willing to, <clears throat> transcend the, the the limitations of terrestrial and look at the bigger picture now we begin to see that yes this planet is part of a very large much larger ecosystem and sometimes that larger ecosystem can throw things at this planet that can be profoundly disruptive to the status quo of nature and of human civilization 